Hi guys. Hi. Everybody, thanks for having me. I'm actually going to start my timer at six minutes to wow. to present you a, a theoretical model on motor control. Um, to give you background, I'd like to consider myself, and I think Francois would, would say the same thing. This is Francois, my my theoretical colleague. We're clinical scientists. We're clinical theorists. We're not researchers. So we're going to present you something that we kind of started observing within our clinic, and then integrating research that we're understanding about the biopsychosocial model, the neurophysiology, and that's what led us to this conclusion, and convince you that motor control has biopsychosocial elements that we need to take into consideration. So a little bit of background on motor control and what it is. Um, I'm sure that you guys all understand the term. We're movement experts. You guys are, are the, the best movement experts out there being part of AOM. But it's defined as a generation and coordination of movement patterns that essentially produce some type of function. I think that the term motor control is often seen as being synonymous with the term stabilization. And that's not true. Stabilization is just a, a part of, of motor control. Motor control may either control movements of body and space or stabilize the body and space. So again, I don't want those two terms to be seen as synonymous. Within our clinical practice, the term motor control is often seen when we describe joint and spinal stability. And as I said in my introduction, I'd like to convince you that, that motor control is essentially influenced by biological, psychological, and social variables. And I'd like you guys to, to think about, is motor control defensive? Meaning, is it an output of the brain similar to pain? Or is it defective, something that's leading to injury? And this takes into account Ronald Meltzak's neural matrix, which I hope that most of you are familiar with. So we're calling our algorithm the MIP algorithm. So what does that stand for? M is motivation. So essentially, one must have motivation to perform an activity. If somebody comes to my clinic, and I examine them, and I get them on the table, and I tell them, okay, I want you to contract this muscle, if it's not meaningful to them, and if they're not convinced that's going to help them, then it probably won't. Along with motivation, there has to be an expectation of recovery. Does this patient expect something's going to happen? Taking into account these psycho variables are extremely, extremely important. And this should set our stage prior to performing that motor control activity. We need to make sure that there's a, a convincing expectation that something's going to happen. It's been demonstrated in the literature that expectations can be influenced by our interactions with our patients. In the journal Physical Therapy, they call that therapeutic alliance. That gets into the discussion, does a poor interaction lead to a nocemic response? Or does a good interaction lead to placebo? Who really cares, but it leads to a good outcome. The I stands for input. And we think that there are several types of external stimuli that can affect that patient's outcome. I was just talking about the clinician interaction. We think that there is clinician-directed input. So the visual input of the facility likely may affect somebody's motor control. And the auditory input, the words that I use to describe how to do something. I was just talking to, to this gentleman from Texas. If I tell that patient they have a bulging disc and show them this spinal model with a, with a little red thing coming out the side, that person may be afraid to contract something. There may be a defensive defensive response of all their action programming, similar to pain, that may limit that, that ability to contract a certain muscle. With input, we gotta think about clinician-directed input manually. We're all manual therapists. So providing this barrage of accurate information up to the brain to prepare it for movement. So we went from motivation, making sure that individual's ready to move, they have the expectation something's gonna happen, getting your hands on the patient, and talking to them in a certain way. And then we get to plan. Plan is probably the most confusing and understood, 
understudied portion of, of our algorithm. And the reason why I say this is because we're just learning the influence of, of the brain on pain and the influence of the brain on motor control. But we have to think, motor control is always beginning in the brain. The prefrontal areas are planning for movement. The premotor, the premotor areas and the supplementary motor areas are, are preparing for movement. The primary motor and subcortical areas are executing movement. There's this combination of, of visual inputs, auditory inputs, and then this cortical planning that's occurring prior to the person actually contracting or, or, or moving a muscle or body part. If there's a cortical smudge, we gotta address that. We don't just have somebody contract something that their brain isn't ready to contract. So what does this mean to us clinically? When we perform motor control activities, we're not telling you how to do it. We're just saying, think about these three variables because we do know that they're influential. Attempt to influence the patient's thoughts about movement, provide some form of input, look at is there a cortical representation, a lot of good research coming out of Australia about this, and then consider movement. And what I'd like you to consider about this, this algorithm, does this make sense to you as a clinician? Thanks guys.